talk, and uh, now we have a talk by Alejandro, and uh, over to you, Alejandro. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so again, thank you so much, especially to the organizing team. Uh, uh, the Euro SciPy is always uh, uh, an incredible event. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about a topic that has been gaining a lot of popularity uh, from a more practical perspective. And this is a practical guide towards explainability and bias evaluation in machine learning. Uh, so a bit about myself, I am currently the chief scientist at the Institute for Ethical AI and Machine Learning. Uh, at the Institute we basically build standards and contribute to policy discussions uh, that ensure the responsible development of machine learning systems. And my day-to-day -day role is at this company called Selden. Uh, we have an open source, open core machine learning deployment library and we focus on the uh, deployment, large-scale deployment of machine learning models in Kubernetes. Some of the examples that I'm going to be uh, using today are leveraging uh, Selden, and uh, they're all open source. Uh, this uh, uh, can be found in my GitHub repo, which I'm going to uh, link at the end. So to get started uh, today, uh, I'm going to cover a hands-on example. And what better way uh, to go through a new topic than uh, using a case study? So we're going to be building a startup. And this startup is going to be called Hype ML. And we are going to be automating a loan approval process in an insurance company. Because what could go wrong there? Uh, terminology is uh, what we're going to be covering today. Uh, we're going to dive into why it's not just about removing bias. Uh, we're going to then break down the three steps uh, that are involved in the process uh, that we're going to propose. Uh, which involves data analysis, model evaluation, and production monitoring. And uh, I realized that I forgot again to uh, change uh, the numbers, so we will have two steps number four. Uh, so yes, HyperMail, a new project has come in. A uh, new in uh, an insurance company basically has a process where they are dealing with a lot of uh, uh, applications for loans, and they basically have a lot of domain experts that analyze that and either approve a loan or reject it. They receive over, over a million applications and they want to automate it. Business wants it to be delivered yesterday and business heard about this machine learning thing and they want all of it, uh, this AI thing. So the team, uh, uh, this hypothetical team, you know, went back and started trying to look at what machine learning was and they found out that machine learning basically boiled down into uh, two key work streams. The first one is the creation of the model. The second one is the deployment and use of that model on unseen data. The standard steps, gathering data, uh, creating some features, selecting a model, uh, uh, defining scoring metrics, and then rinsing and repeating until you're happy, then persisting the model, deploying it in production so that it can actually see any unseen data and perform predictions on that unseen data. So, the team, after seeing how that worked, they said, okay, we need actually data. So they went to business. And then business said, okay, we'll get some data. So they gave them back an Excel sheet with 25 rows. And the team was like, what is this? We cannot do anything with this. So then after pushing back and perhaps 40 meetings, uh, then they managed to get a, a, a data set of 8,000 rows. Uh, and so it began. Uh, the hype ML journey towards greatness. So we got this data. Uh, this is basically 8,000 rows. Uh, they consist of uh, tabular data, uh, features like age, working class, education, etc., etc. And then at the end, whether the loan was approved or rejected. Uh, as the best practices that the team read on the internet, they saw that they should be splitting their data on a training and testing set. And that's basically what they did. Uh, in this case, if we see our, our split data, we can see that we have 6,000 for training and about 2,000 for testing. And what they did is they just took an off-the-shelf Stack Overflow uh, neural network, uh, 100 neurons, uh, one layer, softmax layer at the end, so they get the probabilities at the end. And then they just threw the data and they saw how it worked. Uh, so they started running it and uh, 
you know, you, they, they started seeing uh, very healthy uh, learning curves, extremely healthy learning curves, and they end up seeing that uh, they managed to get 98% accuracy on their first run. What a better score to get on a Friday evening. So who here thinks that, you know, Friday evening is time to, it's time to go to the pub for a beer? Uh, who here thinks that we should deploy? Nice, yes, yes, some cowboys in the room. We deploy. And a few weeks go by after we push to production, and lo and behold, BuzzFeed releases an article saying that HypeML deployed a racist, sexist AI, and the team is baffled. They're like, what did we do wrong? We followed all the instructions in the internet. Um, but then they realized that they actually needed to first see what actually went wrong. So they went back to business and they asked for business to give them all the applications that went through during those weeks. And they gave them back 110 applications and they actually labeled it with what it should have been. So some domain experts actually went through that data. So we have this data set, 110 applications, you know, they're already processed, uh, uh, pre-processed, so the categories are converted into numbers and uh, the continuous variables are normalized. And uh, when we actually evaluate the accuracy, we actually see that we have 54% accuracy. What, what happened with our 98% accuracy? You know, uh, 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 the team was surprised because, you know, their, their, their production data set being different to your training data set, who would have imagined? So when they actually started seeing some of the uh, more advanced techniques, uh, confusion matrix, which we're going to cover in a bit, this basically tells you which uh, are the uh, actual positives and predicted positives. They realized that their model was basically rejecting every single application. You know, you apply for a loan, reject it, right? No matter what you did, it just rejected. So uh, if the data set was skewed towards rejections, I guess it could have still performed well and people would have been, oh my God, this machine learning model is, is amazing, so accurate. Uh, and when they actually uh, uh, you know, saw the ROC curve, which basically plots how much better you're doing than randomness, uh, you should be seeing two lines. Uh, this is basically saying that you're doing exactly like randomness. So you would be performing as, as good as if you had an algorithm that was like, if random uh, 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 double is greater than 0.5, return true, or else false, and then, you know, performs the same. Which is, uh, you gotta put effort to be that, that bad. Um, when we actually look at the data set, we see that the training data, the number of, uh, 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 the distribution was a little bit different. So in production, there is an expectation that some loans are actually going to be approved. Whereas in our training data set, we just had very little example of approved loans. So the model was able to just learn that if it just rejects everything, it's going to get a good accuracy. So it just learned to do that. So in this very simplified use case, we just saw a very, very uh, a high level example of uh, a, a case where algorithmic bias uh, happened, right? And, uh, you know, this is not far from a lot of the use cases that have been uh, taking place in a more uh, high-profile scenarios. And uh, the reason why <clears throat> explainability and algorithmic bias has become such a uh, discussed topic is because of the high profile incidents that have been happening. So Amazon's sexist recruitment tool that was basically rejecting uh, 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 potential uh, recruitment applicants because they had gaps in their employees, in, the, in their employment, which then discriminated towards uh, women that had maternity leave, or Microsoft racist chatbot, which just did online learning on Twitter. How could they not have foreseen that? Learning from just the internet would, you know, turn something to an evil chatbot. Um, but then this actually gets a, a, to more serious uh, cases where it's not just a social media bot, it's actually applications that are taking decisions that um, have an influence on people's lives across uh, a lifetime or even several, right? Like the negative discrimination in automated sentencing, as well as perhaps black box models that are deployed uh, without an understanding of uh, 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 why they perform on several cases when the requirements uh, need that. And the challenge with organizations is that it's not that they wouldn't take uh, risks as, as um, you know, uh, uh, they would normally be much more uh, adverse towards unknown risks. 
So the fact that they would be using uh, technology that they would just not know what the potential risks are. And that is basically what the objective is, is on reducing risk. And the reason why this is challenging is because it is now uh, intersecting with a lot of different fields. And the reason why uh, there is a strong emphasis in this talk is because a large ethical decision of this uh, uh, size should not just fall on the shoulders of a single data scientist. Uh, this is something that should involve multiple different stakeholders across the life cycle of a process. And you know, seeing it in these uh, uh, Venn diagrams, you can see on the left is the technical side where you have the intersection of software engineers, DevOps, and data scientists creating this ambiguous role of a machine learning engineer. You know, the one that you see in some job descriptions where a company is hiring this McKinsey consultant with you know, 10 years experience, with a PhD, uh, uh, you know, 20 years experience in machine learning, deep learning, you know, DevOps, and you know, for the salary of an intern. You know, the, the one that they're all trying to find this unicorn. This ambiguous role, and then on the other side, you have the intersection of uh, machine learning engineering, which is already an ambiguous term that is just thrown at stuff, uh, with industry domain expertise and policymakers that make these industry standards. Um, there is a lot of really good work that is done there, but the challenge is that we need to make sure that the uh, very deep technical side and the higher level regulatory discussions have a connection between. Because otherwise, uh, it doesn't matter if you have your principles and your ethical guidelines and your uh, 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 high level policies, because if you don't have an understanding of what are the ways that you can implement your infrastructure to make sure that you can uh, monitor and uh, enforce some of those policies, you're always gonna have reality not matching, uh, uh, expectations not, ma not matching reality. Um, now the answer, and this is important, is not about removing bias. Because you know, people in this room uh, you know, would know that any non-trivial decision, which basically has more than one option, uh, holds an inherent bias, without exception. So unless you, you train a model where it's only predicting maybe or maybe, then you have a fully unbiased model. Uh, and you know, the reason why it's also impossible to remove bias in a machine learning model is because you are actually training a model to discriminate towards the right answer, right? That is, that is the whole purpose of uh, uh, machine learning. And um, the, the, the purpose here is to actually mitigate for undesired biases. And that's where it gets sli uh, slightly more complex. And the reason why it gets even more complex is because bias is biased in itself. Right? Societal bias carries an inherent bias, which means that something that we may think here in this room to be racist or discriminatory, someone in another room or another continent may think otherwise. Right? So it is also a matter of perception, and it is the question of whose ethics. Right? It's like, what are you really trying to enforce in the, in the, in the uh, algorithms that you're implementing it? The whole point is just, again, emphasizing that these complex decisions shouldn't just uh, rely on the shoulder of a single data scientist. These hard questions that you know, currently are being addressed in end-to-end -end processes on company policies, uh, why should the automation of an existing process go through different scrutiny? Right? That, is, that is basically the main emphasis. And conceptually, the way that uh, I tend to split this is into the concept of statistical bias and a priori bias. So project bias and before the project. So in statistical bias, you can have errors in project decisions, such as suboptimal choices of accuracy metrics, uh, of machine learning models. So this is basically decisions that you take once the project begins. But then the a priori bias is basically uh, these biases that are introduced even before the project starts. Things like lack of understanding of the project, incomplete resources, or even societal shifts in perceptions that now make your labeled data uh, uh, um, you know, incorrect uh, for, 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 for some reason. And explainability is key because, you know, you wouldn't know if you have inherent bias unless you can explain uh, what your current algorithms are abstracting. And a key point is that explainability doesn't equal interpretability. And these are very loose ways that we're using these terms, but the emphasis is that you can use interpretability techniques, but the fact that you're using some of those techniques doesn't mean that you understand what's going on. Right? So there's two levels into it, is making sure that you know what tools are out there and also know how to use them. And from that workflow, traditional data science workflow that we introduced at the beginning, the process that we propose to enhance this is quite simple, which boils down into these extra three steps that are already embedded in best practices of data science. And this boils down in three steps. 
The first one is just data analysis. The second one, model evaluation. And the third one is production monitoring. So now we're going to jump in and get our hands dirty. Uh, but before that, it's just worth emphasizing that explainability has a trade-off. Um, as you introduce uh, those processes in your explainability, uh, in, your, in your machine learning end-to-end uh, 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 -end processes, you, you introduce a level of scrutiny that may result in either uh, reduced accuracy uh, or perhaps even more uh, time that needs to be spent in the choice of the algorithms or in the feature engineering to make sure that some of the um, uh, insights that the model would have learned are actually introduced uh, through, the, through the features, right, as, as a priori knowledge into the models. Um, so, okay, so let's jump right into it and let's jump back into the code. The first part is on data analysis, and here we're going to just cover some techniques uh, that you have probably come across um, around data analysis that you can use to actually uh, understand if, if uh, you know, your current data set has potentially some uh, attributes that may result in biases in your ultimate uh, trained models. And the points that we're going to be covering are things like data imbalances, upsampling, up correlations, uh, trained test set, and then further techniques. And we're going to be using this open source library called XAI, which you can find at ethicalml slash XAI. Um, so let's get started. We're going to take a, uh, the, uh, new, uh, the training data set uh, that you know, we saw in the previous uh, section. And we're going to use one of the uh, techniques called imbalance plots. Um, what this allows us to see is basically the frequency of uh, uh, each of the data points f as a breakdown per feature. And in this case, we want to see the number of examples that we have on the attribute gender. And here we can see that there is a significant higher number of examples for male than female, which may not be uh, a big challenge. However, when we actually are able to look deeper, for example, here we're going to do an imbalance plot of not just gender, but also the uh, target feature loan, we can then see that there are further potential imbalances that may result in biases within our model and potential discriminations that we may not want to embed. And in this case, it just emphasizes that although it seems that you may not have such a strong imbalance in the number of examples across your gender, it, it does showcase that the number of examples in this case of female approved loans are much lower, right? And the emphasis here is not to say we need to make sure that everything is equal, right? Because also what does that mean, right? In this case, it's, all, it, it's more than anything to understand what is the distribution that you're expecting to see in your production uh, data set and then understand that your training data set aligns to that. And furthermore, then the higher level questions could be on whether the model that you deploy could have a negative impact on an already existing societal bias. But then you're going into very complex discussions that you know, wouldn't actually fit within uh, the data science uh, uh, this discussion. Although it would still encompass discussions across the team and as well as the, 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 the project in itself, depending on the impact that the, out, uh, 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 that the uh, project itself could have. Um, and then similarly, you know, you could actually run uh, uh, for continuous data sets, uh, uh, sorry, for continuous features, in this case age, you can see potentially imbalances or, or uh, not as many data examples for a specific age group if it just so happens to be relevant. Uh, furthermore, you know, you can actually go in, into, into other uh, crosses and, and, and explore your data set as you go. For upsampling and downsampling, we provide an out-of-the-box uh, set of tools for you to be able to, say in this case, upsample everything to 0 0.5 and everything above, uh, uh, downsample it. This is just you, uh, duplicating some of the, of the data points randomly. Uh, again, you know, this is something that you should approach with caution. It's not about you just having a full balance in every single potential uh, 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 um, you know, breakdown of, of your features, but it, it is just another tool that you can use at your disposal. And similarly, you know, we, uh, we also provide an ability for you to actually see correlations in a case that you may want to remove a data, uh, a, da a, a, a feature, uh, perhaps because it could be a protected feature. This could be something that you can assess to see whether there is a correlation that could still embed some of the knowledge that that protected feature could have into your data set. Again, it's not about just removing every single thing, because at the, at the end, you know, 
the purpose of machine learning is for you to be able to uh, identify some uh, uh, features in, in your data that it can actually allow the model to discriminate towards. But in the real world, you have some processes like in recruitment where it is illegal, for example, to use some of the protected features. So it's just making sure that you align in some of those areas and even asking the question of like, what would that mean to align? So it's more than anything to ask the questions and understand what are the techniques that are available. Similarly, in uh, training and testing data sets, uh, how you would normally use your scikit-learn train test split. Uh, here we provide a train test split that allows you to actually specify a minimum number of examples per group with, in this case, gender being that group that we want to get a minimum set of examples. And when we actually see it, you know, here you can see that we're actually taking a training, uh, sorry, a testing uh, data set that we would use to evaluate our model that provides a balance uh, amount of, of examples for each class. And that's another thing to, 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 to look out for. There's also, of course, the emphasis that uh, there's a lot of techniques in the space of explainability. And we actually put together a very, very extensive list of production machine learning tools, uh, which you can find at the top. So github.com slash ethical ML slash awesome production machine learning. And this is one of the most extensive lists of uh, tools for production machine learning. So we recommend you to actually like, have a look at that. And if you find a tool that is not there, please add it, submit a PR. But yeah, as, 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 as I mentioned, you know, there's tons of uh, uh, libraries that are for, in this case, uh, visualization. And we have another section for explainability. So now, uh, for model evaluation, that's the second part. We're going to be diving into key points, so standard model evaluation metrics, global model explanation techniques, and black box model explanation uh, methods, as well as other libraries available. Uh, so in this case, we're going to be using one of uh, our uh, seldom libraries called Alibi, which focuses on black box model uh, explanation techniques. And we're gonna actually see what that, what that really means. In terms of the white box versus black box, this basically uh, emphasizes on whether you have access to the internals of the model or you're only interacting with the inputs and outputs, right? Are you trying to reverse engineer? Uh, that's a black box model approach. Or you're trying to use the internals like the, the weights or the uh, random forest uh, decision trees or some of the metrics uh, or, or attributes within the models to be able to understand what's going on. As well as global versus local techniques. Uh, global being able to explain uh, the entire behavior of a model or local basically explaining a single prediction, right? Say you have uh, uh, one prediction that came in, why did that prediction predict whatever it did? Um, we're gonna dive into some examples for both. So now we're gonna, before jumping into it, we're gonna use that data set that we've now uh, 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 re-evaluated and retrained another model. In this case, you can see that it doesn't just uh, shoot straight into, uh, 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 you know, 100%. Uh, 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 you know, it's much more reasonable. And we're gonna dive into some of the standard evaluation matrix. So we actually covered already uh, the, the matrix plot and the ROC plot. Uh, uh, as well, one of the key things is that you can have ROC plots and ma a confusion matrix on a per uh, feature basis. Uh, and, and you can also see some of the metrics like accuracy, precision, recall. Uh, um, but more than anything, the explanation techniques, one very common one that you've probably come across is feature importance. This tries to explain a model on a global approach where it tries to say, well, what are the importances of each of the features? It uses permutation where it actually like uh, shuffles all of the uh, features and tries to see which uh, shuffle influences the most. But we're gonna now dive into black box uh, local model techniques that we use with uh, our Alibi library. And in this case, we're gonna be using anchors, counterfactual instances, and prototype counterfactuals. In this case, anchors answers the question of if you uh, performed a prediction, what are the features in that prediction that influenced the prediction the most, right? So that's basically what anchors does. And in this case, we're gonna be using the Anchor tabular, which is used for tabular data sets, but we also provide text and image. And we're gonna be using uh, this example, right? So we're gonna be saying like, okay, can you please explain that example? We're gonna be uh, passing an, uh, uh, the model uh, that we just trained, and we're gonna be basically saying, okay, please explain how that, uh, what would be the anchors of that, uh, 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 um, a, a, of that specific instance. 
And then it's basically saying of that instance, the anchors are marital status of separated and gender of female. Right? And in this case, you can then ask specific questions such as, well, perhaps these features being the anchors, should I try to evaluate uh, whether my model needs to have some changes, et cetera, et cetera. So you, so you can use some of that insight back into your training. And then similarly, for counterfactuals, it's a different technique that ans asks the question, what are the changes in the features that you can do uh, to change the prediction? Right? So we also have that in our library, which we would encourage you to try out. Uh, we actually released, our data science team released a paper that tackles the challenge with uh, uh, computation. As you can imagine, black box model techniques are very high in the computation side, so uh, uh, they proposed uh, a, a technique guided by prototypes. And of course, shout out to other techniques. Explainability is such an extensive list that you know, I would actually recommend you to dive into several of those areas. And just to rush into the third part, because I know that I've already been given the, the notice, some of the techniques in the production monitoring, uh, all of these examples are uh, uh, open source, so you can try them yourself. So I'm just going to give you a high-level overview. We're going to be using our orchestration and deployment framework called Selden to deploy models in, in uh, Kubernetes. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be deploying that model that is going to expose an API, uh, a RESTful API, so we can send a prediction. It returns a pr uh, so we're going to send an instance. It's going to return a prediction. And then we're going to actually deploy our explainer, which instead of returning a prediction, when we send that instance, is going to interact with that deployed model. It's going to reverse engineer it, and then it's going to return that explanation that we basically just saw. Right? And in this case, the way that you would interact with Selden, you would basically just create a pickle, a dump, of the trained uh, models that you have. So in this case, we're dumping it into a set of files. And then you're going to create a wrapper that loads those uh, models and exposes the transform function uh, so that our wrapper is going to basically just containerize this and put it in production, right? So the magic is all done by defining the dependencies and running this uh, CLI tool that creates a Docker image. Who here has used Docker? Nice, we got a production ready room. Uh, so we created basically with this command an image called long classifier that exposes that uh, function. And if we send a REST request, it gets run through that. And we can now define it and say, I want to run with this image a seldom deployment and just run that file through Kubernetes, which basically uh, is going to deploy it in a Kubernetes cluster. I'm not going to go into the details of that. But basically, what you have is the model being deployed. Uh, similarly, you know we're going to deploy an explainer. So uh, here, you can actually just test it. But we're just going to deploy the explainer. Again, you just train it. Uh, you create a remote function. Uh, you dump that explainer so that you have a pickle. Uh, you create a wrapper, uh, which is just that. And you basically are able to then deploy it with that uh, same function. And once you have that container, which in this case is called long classifier explainer, um, then you basically now have uh, the explainer and the model both in production. And just to show you basically what that would look like, we actually have a UI that allows you to basically see it. So if you send that inference, you see that exact same thing that we saw in the notebook, you know, marital status of separated and gender of female being the core anchors. Uh, but now it's just shiny. And with that, uh, I've managed to cover a bunch of uh, key techniques that you can use for data analysis, model evaluation, and production monitoring. And uh, any questions I can take uh, in the pub later on. But thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, see you at the pub.